How are you doing? Awesome. I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic, fantastic. Been a good uh, for us uh, in Israel. We work from Sunday till Thursday, so for us it's like a start of week now. But uh, the weekend was good. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great to hear. All right. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to do this interview together. I'm really excited to hear the story of Novo. Before that, would you like to share some information about your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm 29 uh, years old in this Friday, uh, turning 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been into kind of entrepreneurship and building stuff and breaking stuff for the past 10 years uh, together with my co-founder, Tomer, uh, which we've been working together since. Uh, and Nobu is my uh, third company together with him. And prior to that, I've been doing some uh, kind of music stuff uh, and then realized, you know, music, I really enjoy it, but it's really hard, you know, making a living out of it in the end. So this is where kind of my all, you know, all the time interest in computers and, and stuff kind of popped in and, and then uh, there's this history. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And of course, I'm, I'm curious to hear if there's any lessons learned from touring with a band and uh, from all that experience. So it's now Novo, a uh, notifications platform that is open source. Uh, how did it come about? How did you decide to start it? What did it look like early on? Yeah, so funny enough, Novo started in our second company. We've been building a recreational sports marketplace. And yet another time we had to build, you know, uh, a notification in front of the product. And then I remember like Tom and I sat in, in the office late night and then like, what if, you know, this could be a standalone, you know, service and a product and people can consume it as a service. And then I remember we like done a lot of diagrams uh, on the whiteboard and, and, and it's like, yeah, and it can be like this and et cetera. And we, we have this thing with Tomer, we're like, you know, we, we love to think about stuff. So we're like, hey, let's, you know, we build this whole company in our head and then like, you know, in the end of the evening, yeah, sounds good and, and, and forget about it, you know, <laughs> for a while. Um, so a similar thing happened with Novo is we kind of experienced this from our first paint, did this whole ideation about it and then forgot about it for like almost two years or something like this. Um, and since then, after that, like after we closed our second company and we kind of thought about, okay, what's the next thing for us? Kind of what's the next thing we want to work on? And we had a, a break time. We didn't kind of start anything. We told like, okay, we're going to think about it. Like we really wanted to find a good fit for us as founders as well, because the first company for us was, uh, you know, a CRM software in the insurance industry, recreational sports marketplace. So although I'm trying to be, you know, athletic and, and do my sports, I, I we don't really have, you know, a strong passion for this, like from as a user perspective, you know, uh, for it. And for the next company, it was really important for us. And we did a lot of research and et cetera. And we've been consulting to a few companies here in the Israeli ecosystem back then. And we actually, with two different friends, like we, like they've been trying to solve the same thing, basically, again, the notification infrastructure in their own companies. And then like, Tomer, okay, it was such a coincidence. And like, okay, we must do this, you know, kind of uh, uh, thing. So this is like very, very early days, like, okay, cool idea. Let's see what's going on in the market. Let's see what's going on, you know out there like are we the only stupid people in the world or like somebody else trying to do this as well um and yeah this is kind of how it started you know kind of the pre uh pre novo phase basically i i appreciate the background thanks so much and uh you know i think uh the the notion of you know pivoting into something or starting something new where it's closer to home and you know solves your own problem whatnot that's something we also share uh from our own experience so now uh, you decided to start Novo. Uh, what did it look like attracting the first contributor and maybe leading up to the first launch and community? Uh, yeah. So funny enough, uh, Tomer and I both coming from technical background, Tomer kind of took the pivot, you know, to more the other important stuff in the business, you know, not only the, the engineering part, um, but we both kind of experienced it on the engineering part but then because we had you know multiple roles as founders in in our companies like a product role and like a lot of things we were a bit confused of who's the responsible 
person inside the organization that will be working with something like Novo. And our initial hunch was that it's something that is for the product people, you know, that this is the product team, they will be the, the ones responsible for it. We've done a lot of user interviews uh, back in the time, I think more than hundreds, like with local Israeli companies, big, small enterprise, you know, trying to understand what people are doing. Like, are they, they already, there is a product on the shelf, they're building it in-house, what's going on with there? Uh, and the first POC we actually built for Novo was not open source. It was uh, dedicated for product people as a persona. It was uh, quite a different uh, product uh, in the beginning. And after a while, and I think we almost like 10 months, uh, we've built the POC. We've done, you know, kind of a lot of those conversations with potential customers and with all of those people, we spoke with the product people, they got what we're doing, you know, they understand like the what it solves in the end. But because the product people are kind of the guardians of focus in the organization, you know, for them, it's like, yeah, we've done it, you know, last, uh, you know, last quarter, like we plan to do it maybe in two quarters from now, oh, not the good time for it. And the ones that it was a good time for them, like we did find a good timing of them want to invest in the notification infra, they were like, hey, go speak with my VP engineering or like, you know, the, the, the engineering folks in the organization because they are one, the ones that are actually responsible for this. And after we've done a few of those, we like realized we're we are selling Novo twice. Once uh, from the product and then the product kind of hands us over to the engineer. And the conversation was not easy because the engineers, they were like, yeah, we can build this alone. Like we don't need, you know, like a closed product and like, we didn't frame Novo correctly to them. It was like, you know, they, they're they very defensive. Like, yeah, we, we, we will build this. You cannot, like, we cannot integrate this and et cetera. Um, so this this was the first iteration of Novo. Like, it's nothing open source and engineering, uh, you know, oriented as, as, as we know it today. Um, and this is basically when we had to pivot. Like, we understand, like, after a few of those, we're doing something wrong. You know, it's like, we cannot do this sell twice it's so hard so long and etc and i remember when we saw it, and tomer and i like we are both in the open source community for quite a, a while we have a few open source libraries that we kind of created back then and like really enjoyed the whole motion of it and then i said like hey why won't we try you know something um and to see if like engineers get it you know like if they are actually understand what we're doing so the first version of Novo on open source was a Node.js library with 25 lines of code. Basically, it's a it was a very a very simple stateless library that all we've done is like we said, okay, there are three tiers to notifications. There is the delivery provider, there is the message content of the notifications, and there is the actually trigger that triggers the notification. And all of them are decoupled from each other, and you can switch, you know, the different phases of it. Um, we got it out. It was nice. Uh, nothing crazy happened. You know, it was like, okay, like a few folks saw it and like it was some nice traction. Didn't do anything specific. We just sent it to a few WhatsApp groups of friends and et cetera, but there was no really traction out of it. And after a while, we spoke with Tomer and like, okay, we see this is like getting some traction, but it's nothing substantial. Maybe we will share, you know, our uh vision about what we want Novo to be not what it is today you know like the whole api based kind of dealing with time zones user preferences like embeddable notification like really whatever we thought Novo could be one day and we got a dev2 uh we wrote like this blog post on dev2 about like yeah, building the first open source notification infrastructure kind of this was the title i can later send you the link uh so you can also share it uh with it and i remember that we kind of, it was a Hail Mary kind of movie, like, okay, like, let's put it out there, like, whatever happens, happens, and, you know, kind of, we just wanted to see if developers get what we're doing, like, are the right target persona, and we, we put it out, nothing happened, uh, <laughs> we went... Uh, I remember it was on a friend's wedding and then suddenly like I'm, I'm, I'm checking out on GitHub and people like joining Discord and, you know, writing GitHub issues. And so I said, Tomer, something is going on. Like there is quite an unusual amount of traffic to Novo. And then I went to Google Analytics and then like I'm seeing like, you know, hundreds of concurrent, you know, uh, visits and also on GitHub, like it's exploding, people entering Discord, like what's going on there? 
Uh, and we asked a few folks and they're like, hey, Google picked you up and like trending posts, you know, on their Google feed, uh, cool. like on the mobile apps. And we had so much traffic during that weekend. Um, and from there, it all kind of exploded. Uh, we had folks kind of coming in and saying, hey, we just built this a few months ago, but it's not working for us and we maintain it now and it's a mess. And like people really kind of shared a lot of their experience with those system in-house and some folks wanted to build something with it. And so, yeah, this is exactly what we need. Where guys have you been like a few months back? And and it kind of gave us the clear lights of, okay, there is a fit there. We don't show sure yet what the product will look like and what it's going to be, but like there's definitely, you know, people get, engineers get what we're doing and there's a clearly like a good, a good fit out there. So and from there, it all started kind of, you know, uh, the, the first version was 20 lines <laughs> of, of JavaScript code. And then the, the release after this a few months later was like the novel as we know it today, an API and web interface and, and, and all of that. Wow, wow. That's, that's an amazing story. Thanks so much for uh, unpacking all this for us. And already some lessons uh, learned here. I mean, you mentioned earlier on how, you know, the user, the customer, kind of like pay attention to the persona. You don't want to be selling twice. And then if people actually yeah. understand what you're meaning to do. And I take a special note of, you know, your Dev2 uh, launch blog post where actually we're talking with my co-founder about doing one ourselves yesterday. You said we didn't just talk about where we are today, but where we want to go and what we envision the product to be. And laying that out, and it sounded like that made a difference there. So, you know, for everyone listening, I think that's a, that's an important point. So, with now this early traction um, forming, um, you guys probably thought about going into you know company building territory for supporting the the endeavor, the venture. So, what did that look like? And basically, if you could talk about you know funding, hiring, and maybe yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, definitely like for the long term. So we've been working on this almost a year with Tomer, you know, it's, it wasn't a company yet. Like we in the POC modes, we're running and we're speaking like with big companies and they're like enterprise selling companies. And they're like, even for running the POC, like, yeah, we don't even have an entity, you know, like a legal entity to work with. So it was, <laughs> it, it imposed a few challenges there. Um, and so after the initial traction, what happened is that we got, uh, inbound uh, basically from a few VC funds uh, in the US and European ecosystems. And apparently we didn't realize that, but they are monitoring a lot, the open source kind of ecosystem and, you know, they're rising and like based on some vanity metrics like stars and et cetera, but they, they you know, able to, okay, like this looks interesting, like this has potential to be like a product and et cetera. So we got an inbound reach of a few investors and, uh, We've been in this phase kind of previously as well. So like the first thing we've done to all those investors, not looking for money, sorry, we're busy, you know, but let's, <laughs> let's speak about it later. Can speak right now. So basically started to create this demand. And after a while, I was still like, okay, should we go out for a funding round right now? Like, is it a good timing and et cetera? And after we decided, you know, okay, yeah, we should do a funding for this. Like this looks promising. There is so much unknown you know, like questions we need to answer, but we do believe like there is something in there, like people, you know, there is something we feel about it in our need. We spoke with a lot of friends, like, okay, this is like, people need this. Now we need to figure out, you know, the product market fit for it. What's the product for it? What's all of those things, but like the need is there and, 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 and the need is like quite broad in terms of the market, you know, size and, and opportunity and et cetera. Um, so this is one like, okay, we decided to go for the funding, the funding, you know, like on the technicalities of it, it's, it's really important to align, you know, to do a dedicated work. So we, it was a one month of basically a very organized one month of, of fundraising process where we basically aligned everyone into the same timeline of, okay, we have the first two weeks and then like we try to control, you know, the, the whole dynamics of the round to make sure that we get on top of it uh, on one hand, we get the best uh, 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 results we have. And we, we've like, we've done like crazy, you know, from seven in the morning until like 2 a.m. at night, like in the office, speaking with US funds, you know, like all the times on differences. Um, and in the end, like we, I think we spoke with over 100 VCs in, in that month. Uh, so the pipeline was quite high and the importance was having this pipeline, you know, managed by us and not managed by them so we know like okay 
you got until next week to move to the next step. Otherwise, sorry, like we don't want to waste time on this. So like this is the technicalities of, of you know, around, but yeah. And, and basically after that, we closed our uh, seed funding in uh, January, basically of uh, last year. And since then, you know, building the company, hiring the first crazy people to join us and we can ch chat about it in, in a second, like, because it's a strange thing, you know, you reach out to somebody from the internet, uh, <laughs> from the open source community and like, hey, leave your job and come to work with us like somebody that never met us if he searches about notifier back then there is nothing on the internet you know it's like i the first people came to know who i am <laughs> like i really appreciate them because they made like a crazy move i i'm not sure if i would done it you know <laughs> if i was in their shoes but th these are the first crazy employees uh that joined us um i love it Thank and you. yeah were those, were those, uh, did they already contribute or did you know them or spotted them online? And what did they look like? Yeah. So a combination, uh, we had a few of the open source contributors. We had uh, David uh, was the first one kind of that was really excited about the project uh, prior to anything like from the small lib we had uh, and really got in touch. And one day he calls me like on Discord and says, hey, Dima, I have this crazy idea. Let's take this, you know, uh, um, you know, the 20 line library we have and let's create, you know, a service for it, an API and like, okay, David, come. <laughs> you, you got it, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, and, 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 and the initial folks, obviously, because we're in the market for, you know, in the industry here in the Israeli ecosystem for quite a while. So it was also easier for us to get young, the first few folks also from our personal networks and, and kind of have the first people uh, from there. And after that, it's like, mostly a lot of folks from the open source community and uh, yeah that's uh, that's basically perfect. it perfect. is there is there a next milestone coming up that you might like to talk about or uh... so really right now we are working you know on making the 1.0 novel and this is coming together with learning about the different use cases and one of the hard things we have today is that we need to create something that is very flexible to suit a lot of use cases, you know, with a very generic way. And like, it sounds, you know, like easy. And then on the other hand, not very easy at all. Like, and, and, and now the focus is basically learning about this use cases, understanding the different paths of companies using Novo, the different types of companies using Novo, like a B2C, a B2B, a B2B2C, like there's so much variation. But in the end, we need to provide something that can suit the wider audience we can, but we still want to be focused, you know, on the engineering on like, not to be broad enough. Like for example, everything that is marketing automation, we don't even touch it. Like with Novo is, you know, like go use Intercom or HubSpot or whatever. Like we don't do this. Uh, we are focused on the transactional notifications, like a very, kind of trying to close our market to be more focused about what we're doing. Um, and, and this is really the focus right now is kind of wrapping this in, in, into a wholesome product. Uh, uh, I like that. I like it. And that's, and that's actually what, you know, makes us interested in a, as a project to also use, uh, use Novo, um, which is actually we're in the process of, of implementing for Algora. So mm -hmm. it sounds, I, th I think this, like specific spot where you're at, like is where a lot of challenges like come up essentially, you know, accommodating all the different use cases, picking an audience to focus on, and then accordingly figuring out monetization and a business model that goes with it. Is there any sort of heuristic you have applied or kind of like a, a rule or a framework you have with your team in terms of how you're approaching it right now and, you know, how you're managing all this? Yeah. So, you know, eventually when you start and you're, you know, not a lot of people and like, it's kind of in your head, you know, like the conversation with people you're doing and et cetera. And actually like a few months back, we come to the point where we have, you know, I think on the daily basis around like 70 to 80 inquiries from multiple channels about the product, uh, feature suggestions, uh, problems, bugs, uh, you know, everything. And we have multiple people facing those. For example, Emil, who is leading our community efforts, is getting you know the feedback on Discord uh, and like his outreach to people. And then we have the support channels of Intercom, where we have somebody that doing like a 
part-time support role that get the inquiries from there. And then we have the customer conversations with the product. Uh, and then we have sales conversations with uh, Tomer. So you have a lot of feedback coming in and kind of centralizing this feedback and making sense out of it, it becomes really hard, specifically when you need to understand, okay, is it a 2000 employee company asking for this or is it an indie dev that needs like, you know, something for himself that asks for it? And, and then how do you prioritize between those? So right now we are working on consolidating all the feedback into a single place. And I can give a shout out uh, to folks uh, called Product Lane, uh, which we are uh, working on a kind of beginning the integration with them right now is that basically we're putting all the customer feedback in there from Intercom, from Discord, from GitHub issues, from calls, meeting notes, and et cetera, into a single place. And then kind of beginning to understand, okay, like tagging every conversation we have to get like a bird's eye view above everything. It's a challenge. Uh, <laughs> We've done a lot of integrations, Discord bots to make it happen. Uh, but uh, this is really one of the things we're focused on right now is like system, creating a system kind of for aggregating this knowledge and, and, and acting upon it. And thanks for sharing this. Uh, and uh, it sounds like the pricing part, business model part, monetization, the sort of like uh, what you're doing there will surface from this clarity and product roadmap so yeah so we it was important for us you know up front with the community to say hey we are also uh, a business you know we need to sustain ourselves somehow to to keep kind of supporting the open source motion we have and we released the cloud version of novo quite early on like in the very first like and we have friends in the open source community that have been doing you know like no cloud for like three years and, and then only doing like, if you look at Strapi or like a lot of the other products out there, like they just recently announcing like the cloud services of theirs. Um, and for us, it was like important to do it in the beginning because we need to, like we have challenges that maybe some of our self-hosted customers don't have because of the scale of supporting, you know, a few companies that send millions of events per week. Uh, and we need to like, be able to work with it on a single kind of place so we released it quite early on and with the cloud service you know it's quite straightforward like we don't reinvent the wheel there is like a usage-based kind of classical uh, pricing and on the other hand we have the enterprise motion of you know the on-prem managed services that we provide for them and and this is more of the enterprise kind of sales motion um but most of it is inbound basically engineers find us on GitHub on et cetera, and then reach out, hey, I work at company X and we want to do this. Can you jump on? Like, And, and then it kind of kicks uh, off from there. But the monetization part is definitely like one of the next legs for us. Mm -hmm. For now, we just focused you know, on making a good product and like learning from whatever we can. And after that, it's definitely figuring out you know, the monetization part, which, which is with open source companies, it's, it's always tricky in a sense. Um, but on the other hand, like we we planned for this kind of from the beginning, so I hope you know we'll we've done the right uh, decisions and we'll we'll soon figure it out. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, is there something additional that could be said about your choice to introduce the cloud version early on? I I personally like that. I'm just curious for other people in this position and thinking about that. Um, does it help with anything additional? For instance, you know analytics and seeing how people use your product? Is there some other considerations? Uh, yeah. Exactly, 100%. Like, this is one of the things, like, understanding usage. Like, we did see, you know, a lot of interest from the open source community to share feedback. Nonetheless, even, like, when we don't have, you know, the classical analytics available, but still being able to see and monitor and experiment. And it's a huge difference, in my opinion. And there is a lot of folks doing also analytics on the you know, self-hosted kind of editions and also on the, like, you can opt in for, like, sharing wow. some aggregated analytics to help, you know, improving the product. But with the cloud, it's, like, it's very dynamic for us. We can deploy version, see, like, the experiment, how it goes. Um, and also begin, you know, because we do believe there is a thing, like, to have Novo, you know, being able to scale for like a huge amount of events and notification. There's a lot of moving parts and our vision was, you know, register, get an API key and like we we take it care for you. Uh, so you don't have to do like the whole DevOps and, 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 and stuff of it. So I, we thought it was one of the, you know, 
added values of Novo and why you would want to use Novo. So the managed service on the cloud like was one of those things where we thought, yeah, it's we think it's like it's a value we provide for users, you know, to not need to manage everything by themselves. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh so now what does your day-to-day -day look like? Uh right now and you're in israel probably connecting with a lot of founders there i mean you already know most people so yeah just curious what it looks like and if there's uh, any advice that surfaces from a personal standpoint as a founder who's done this again and again going through these motions uh yeah yeah so i i, I think for now right now is my and thomas focus is really to build the best team we can and not interfere with their work you know kind of <laughs> this is the 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 main thing we're trying to focus on. Um, I think the early stages is still kind of where there is a lot of steering, you know, from Tomer and me regarding the product direction and kind of, you know, where are, do we want to head? But it's basically how can we create a framework for uh, the people at our team uh, to be, you know, the to do the best uh, of their abilities and not to interfere with them and not to block them and provide them the flexibility of, you know, experimenting and, 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 and having wild ideas and, and those things. And it's always a challenge between kind of, you know, building a strong team, building a, a strong foundation, specifically with remote work. Uh, no, we don't have offices at all. So we, basically all the team is remote. I think today we're at around like eight or nine countries uh, spread. And there is challenges to that. There is like there is challenges being an open source community. It's like you know there is we when we speak with founders, they're like you guys chose you know the 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 path that kind of with most unknowns and you know a very different approach from from everybody else here in the ecosystem. But we enjoy it. You know it's uh, it's it's a fun challenge. I think. <laughs> any any lessons learned from in terms of building community and managing it as it grows? Yeah, uh, quite a lot. And Tomer and I in in the year before we started Novo, we 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 took some time off and we said like, okay, we want to do something, you know, not a business, just something fun for us. And we've built a bread ba a bread baking community uh, in Israel. Yeah, so we we've got like a a content with. Uh, website with a lot of content recipes and like a community to help us out and this was kind of some of the things where we learned a lot of lessons I think that we applied to Novo and and one of them was that you know you you cannot force uh to build a community you, you cannot force it too much you know it's like if you imagine it like a garden you know with vegetables and and, and flowers or whatever you cannot force it to grow you know 10x faster just because you do like you know something you can provide it you know the best environment possible you can provide it the best nutrients possible but you need to give it time and you it kind of taking on by itself and creating this diversity of, of different people different cultures different ideas and like providing a good environment for it and you just need to let it time you know it's like you cannot force some things in life um so this analogy of you know a garden kind of uh, building it was something that we took with us uh and it's it's something that we i believe doing till this day and is it's a time investment you know it's a focus investment it's a time investment this is a decision you need to make like okay do i want to invest in this or not um but definitely there was like a lot of i think it's a you know a one hour topic on its own like you know a lot of things you can do and but I think the main kind of thesis of you need to kind of give it the right environment and nurture, you know, the people and the, like the people that coming in and give them place and give them, you know, ability to express themselves and, and feel part of it, basically. Um, I don't think every product needs a community, in my opinion, you know, it's uh, because there's need to be a cause, you know, around it, uh, something that people will feel, you know, they can participate in it. Uh, we could do this because, you know, our whole product is open source. And if we would do only, you know, like SDK only kind of uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> open SDK kind of only world, it was, I think, harder for us to build a community on it. It's possible. I, I, I do believe it is. But you need to find the reason, you know, the cause of, of your community and why people should spend their weekends, you know, participating and helping other folks and, and et cetera. Um, but yeah, like 
in a nutshell. But uh, there is, I think we can do a whole <laughs> a whole hour about it. But this is very interesting and insightful. So maybe just a, an additional you know comment here. Uh, why do you think people contribute to Novo today and to contributors listening? If you would like to tell them something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think right now is a very broad and there, we identified a few, you know, kind of areas uh, of, of types of contributors. So the first, uh, the first type of contributors, and this is the also the early adapters we had in the community. This is the folks that, you know, have built this previously in their companies and they like they really connected to the pain and like they see, you know, how it can help them and et cetera. And they're were really excited from the very beginning to participate and help. Uh, this is the one kind of type of people. Uh, the other ones is just people who want to learn, you know, they are maybe new to the tech industry and Novo is, you know, we have a uh, kind of it's a, for a full stack developer, you know, we have the front end and with React, we have the back end with Node and like using MongoDB and like you have a real kind of life, you know, application that you can learn from how it works, how it operates and, and how do you work in a team environment with all, like pull requests. So we had also a few folks that just, you know, might not be experienced with what Novo was trying to do, but they want to learn and, and and it's a great place. And for example, my my little brother, Nikita, he wants to get into tech as well. And he's done a few studies and courses, you know, in in in, in front end and back end. And he was like, hey, I and he just went and started to contribute, you know, also to Novo because for him it's like you learn some stuff in theory, but like how it looks like in a real world application, you know, with like big project and etc. Um how old this is he? sorry. How old is he? Uh 20. 20 yeah so in, in college is he going to college yeah so he's you know after the army here and like in israel like you have the three years you know kind of army army duty and only after that you can start your life basically so he is in that you know that stage right now um and so this is the other part and then we have also folks that you know working using novo uh in their companies and they hey we need this very strange SMS provider that only operates in, uh, you know, Singapore or whatever, and then they can, instead of just sending a support ticket and then hoping for the best, uh, they can actually, hey, maybe we are the only people in the world using this provider, but we can actually, you know, integrate it into the product because it's open source and we can see under the hood and contribute. Um, this is kind of the three main characters. Uh, maybe I forgot some, but uh, this is the main reason uh, we've seen. And I think it's important probably to do that breakdown, um, the segments of, of users, and I don't think there's any additional strategy on that, but that makes total sense. Um, you know, bef before I run you out of time, I just wanna, you know, wanna make sure I try to extract as much advice as possible for you, but also if time allows, maybe hear a little bit about your music background or some other lessons learned uh, throughout your journey. And of course, to point people to go to Nova and contribute. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. So. Uh... You know, with my music background, I think there is a lot of lessons kind of, I think you utilize in the business world uh, after that. Um, and we've done a lot of, um, with my band. So we kind of, you go through this founder kind of phase, you know, you, you know, your product is your music. Basically you need to build it, create it. You need to market it. You know, you need to sell it. You need to like, there is, it's, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you need to find sponsors and you need to find a label or you need to like operations of going on a tour. And it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's like a business and a startup in a, in a different area, but a lot of the things are, are very similar there. And you know, we kind of, we've done a lot of growth hacking and we've done a lot of, you know, marketing stuff with being an indie, you know, uh, band. And I think we've, we've got, you know, like to, I think we've been the only unsigned band in Ubisoft's uh, Rocksmith and, you know, in a lot of kind of big places where like, hey, how the hell you guys <laughs> ended up here, you know? Um, and there is a lot of, you know, this mindset of, one of the important lessons, you know, I've found is that people, you know, in everything, in, in, in a band, in a company, in a startup, in a whatever is the most important thing, you know, and it's like what each person contributes. And with the band, we had, you know, amazing writer, lyrics writer, marketing, uh, you know, operational parts. And 
when you have kind of this collaboration and everybody brings his own kind of thing to the table and specifically with founders, this is what I kind of always recommend is that having somebody that kind of completes you, you know, with a different skills, uh, skill set, but on the other hand, also sharing a lot of interest with you. So it's like, it's not only, you know, opposites, but you also have some fun together and you can kind of complete each other and not necessary. Both of you are doing, you know, uh, the same thing, like you're both the best marketing people in the world. From kind of the founder's perspective, you need to have this, you know, combination of skills and, and hopefully uh, give each other the space to do his own thing and kind of, you know, making the best uh, he possibly can. So those are the things that I learned really kind of in the early, in my early music career. And I, I take it with him, them with me, like really for the whole time, I think. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You're forced to, to, to reckon with. That's uh, that's amazing. And it is kind of like you're running a startup. <laughs> this, this, yeah, this. yeah. As a, as a closer, would like to hear maybe any any last thoughts from you. And then, of course, to uh, you know tell people again uh, how they can uh, get help with uh, Novo, how they should try it, and where to go. Yeah, sure. So I, I think, you know, I think we are in a very exciting time right now and specifically with the commercial open source kind of world i think there's a lot of new opportunities uh, out there like specifically and you see this right now you know every closed source company there is an open source alternative uh, right now and uh, amazing folks for example uh, eldad from upright and a lot of folks that kind of taking the big you know uh, uh, players in this field and kind of going through the engineers as go to market basically and being able to kind of you know get them excited about something and then those engineers are bringing those products inside their organizations and kind of utilizing them you can see this with cal.com you can see this like with so many uh different areas and i think there is an interesting space here right now there is a lot of uncertainty in many areas there but i think there is also a great opportunity to build things in the open you know we we share our uh, uh, handbook as a company also publicly available on Ocean and maybe we can also attach this later and you know we share about company stuff you know how we do vacation day and you know like how we operate in our like day to day and like sharing trying to share as much as we can and what we've seen this is is it helps us also with people coming to work you know at Novo transparency part of it is that it really helps us with attracting you know people and the right type of people because they can actually see you know how we operate and with engineering is that you know usually you sign up with a company and they would tell you you know like it's yeah we are you know test driven and like we have this amazing architecture and then you join and then it's like a mess you know in the code base and and with us you know it, it might be a mess in the code base but at least you can see it you know up front and see like okay you know this is what you get <laughs> once you join you know um so being transparent i think for us is really one of our core values as a company and again, it comes with our engineering uh, stuff we're doing. We, for example, we don't have Slack. Uh, we don't use Slack in the company. We are in our, you know, we are in on Discord with our community. You know, we're living there basically. Um, and with our Notion handbook and everything combined, I kind of like, I want to encourage people, you know, be open about the stuff you're doing and, People always, you know, like ask me, yeah, but what the competition can see what you're doing. I'm like, I don't care. You know, as long as they are busy, you know, going after us, you know, and, mm -hmm. and we are able to kind of be in front and kind of learn and, and, and make it quicker. We don't really care about those things. And, you know, it's for us, we're just able to learn so much faster by doing so. And I can only recommend, you know, folks specifically in the open source world, it's kind of, you know, hard to do it without you know being transparent in a sense but you can always choose the level of transparency as a company and i think for us it's like i one of the biggest growth engines for us was being transparent so i can only recommend that i love it i love it and and, and also love the opportunity we have to go a little a little extra on this interview i'll try to make uh, the most out of it thank you so uh you know maybe maybe just touching on this a little more and taking it from an ecosystem standpoint, commercial open source today, which you know looks and feels different from you know a few years ago. Uh, even is there something to be said here? Uh, how you and your team have sort of like been navigating this? And yeah, uh, curious to hear your thoughts on it. So 
one of the things, you know, and this is coming from two different perspectives out of it. So one of them is that engineers, you know, in the world, there is a big, you know, audience of engineers. I don't think is it Martin Fowler, I think once said that like the amount of engineers in the world, I think it doubles, you know, each, I think three or four years or something like this. Um, and engineers today, they are, they have a lot of, you know, buying power, basically, they have a lot of influence, they have a lot of specifically with, you know, it's not relevant for every type of product, obviously, but specifically for the products that do touch with engineering, like, and, and they have like a say in it, or they're the target audience of it. I think it's much easier for an engineer to see, you know, what's going on under the hood of the product on the other hand to see the community to being able to see okay like we can get support like they can evaluate it uh and and they are mostly more you know they are willing to help like we 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 see it right now with novo is that the willingness to help the willingness to make it better and kind of participate in it is amazing and I think this is what makes costs and commercial open source kind of very amazing you know uh, as is and because of this kind of combined forces uh with increasing buying power and you know some of the tools is that a lot of companies right now you know trying to be focused on what they're doing you know we don't want to reinvent the wheel as a company if we can get you know mixed panel or segment or plausible for analytics i don't want to build this in-house i don't want to maintain an email server when i have some grid or twilio and Prior to that, some cases, companies were doing that, you know, it's like it was a common thing, like you build your own email server, you build your own analytics uh, uh, in front, etc. And today, I think kind of the competitiveness against other products forces you to focus on the core of the things you're doing. All the other things are, you know, you can either buy them or you can use them as an off-the-shelf solution so you don't have to you know, invest the very precious engineering time into doing so. And I think this opens a lot of opportunities uh, for layers of the software that once was, you know, something that you've just built it in-house. Imagine like billing, you know, with Stripe. Prior to Stripe, like a lot of the time you would just build a billing system and Excel, like and build it from scratch. And it was a common thing to do. And specifically for us with notifications, it's a very similar thing of that, you know, it's like, our main competition right now is building it in-house. You know, we, we have obviously competition and there is one and like we don't hide from it, but most of the folks never heard about them. And our main competition is to tell, hey, don't build this by yourself. You can just use Nova for it. Uh, and this is the main struggle we have right now. So I think there is a lot of opportunity in opening up and also in the years uh, to come. This is prominent in... Uh, venture funding, like the whole ecosystem is growing to that, you know, there is like licensing and regarding like the fundraising. So there's a lot more openness to this because, you know, there was more uh, things to look at and a lot of companies that had success that done this, this similar path and you can kind of understand, okay, I'm, you know, it can be done uh, in, in a sense. So it all kind of contributes to this growth in my opinion. Absolutely. And people starting out today, you know, you know, uh, first time founders, for example, uh, they might be looking at all this and, you know, the decision to open source might be something that they think about early on. More people start thinking about that. It might even be a standard thing you need to consider. So is there something here to share in terms of, you know, when it makes sense, when it doesn't, you know, how it's not maybe for everyone or it is? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, in my opinion, they're like, if you go with open source way, like the engineer must be, you know, in, you know, a, like somebody that is, you know, will be using this or is a, like in a position to influence like using this because otherwise, and it's not even true, as I told you before, you know, right now, because the engineering like community, like in the engineers in the world is growing so much. You can have just direct to consumer kind of B2C products uh, that engineers could be users of them. And if you're doing it correctly, it can leverage it. For example, call.com, you know, scheduling, uh, it's open source and it's like the target audience is not necessarily engineers, but they built it in such a way, you know, how do you build your product to be extendable to, you know, the marketplace and being able to build, you know, providers and connections and integration. So engineers can really, you know, participate uh, in it. So I think there is a lot of use cases where it's not like you can have any product, you know, just, but, but, and it's still working in my opinion in some cases, but 
there it's it's it comes with a struggle you know it's a lot of times it's not only fun and and, and easy and it comes to monetization i think is one of the hardest things you know you can be the most amazing open source product and you have no commercial success you know out of it so you need to plan for it and you need to be smart about it um uh, licensing how big is your product can amazon just come and say hey you know what like if it's too low level they could say hey we just manage it on amazon like if it's you know a database or something like this so there's things to consider depending on the type of product you're doing um so there is a lot of consideration i would say but i i, I do think like there is more and more examples to learn from and because of the transparent nature of those companies you can really learn a lot by you know going and like seeing uh, companies like gitlab or seeing companies like uh, uh really a lot of folks like sharing a lot of knowledge so you can you don't have to be the first one to do something you can just see like different approaches and then choose what works for you Totally, totally. And uh, what you said about the number of engineers, you said doubling every few years or whatnot. I mean, I, Fowler, who was the guy who... I think it was either Uncle Bob or I, I, I don't remember, like it was in one of the lectures, like in terms of, you know, if you look at historically, it was the number. And I, I think that the, the trend is yeah. in a similar projection. Like everybody I know from my, you know, obviously I'm biased, but if I look at my family or like, you know, not probably like, people related to work obviously which will be engineers but engineers everywhere really everywhere yeah. right now and yeah, i think 2018 i remember github uh, you know near the time when we were acquired they had around 40 million users and today it's like over 120 million right and that's yeah. like five-ish years six years yeah six years. so that, that kind of checks out um and do you think engineers are sort of like the new King makers, let's let's call it, because their purchasing power is increasing, uh, the the importance of having the right tools. Uh, so, is there something we can say here? Is that correct? And do you think it becomes more lucrative to build developer tools in that regard? I think I think in a sense, specifically for developer tools, now that you have so many engineers, you know, productivity and a lot of things, and engineers right now are. If previously, you know, you would build something for, you know, if you look, what's the difference specifically right now between, you know, like. 15, 10 years from now is that if you build something for engineers, you know, like, yeah, it doesn't matter how it looks. It doesn't matter, you know, as long as it functions, like it's fine. Uh, and I think today it changes very drastically with amazing companies. For example, uh, folks from Raycast and the folks from Linear uh, are leading, you know, the design kind of standards of the industry while targeting engineers, you know, as one of their uh, target audiences. And you see a lot of more investment in the quality of products and the design and user experience, which I think previously was done for B2C, you know, uh, stuff and B2D was kind of, yeah, if it works, it works. And that's the most important thing. Um, and it leads again, a door to a lot of opportunities and kind of the bar goes higher, I think. Uh, and it's to the point where like you, it's hard to compete, you know, with those amazing companies and they're venture funded and et cetera for their user experience, for their uh, design and for their kind of usability and et cetera. So I think this is also a bit changing. And I, I do think there is a lot of opportunities in the developer tooling again, because it's a it's an expensive resource and you need to be productive and you know all the AI thing going on right now. And there's a lot of room, I think, for cool stuff to be built there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, from when, when you were starting out, were there any people in the ecosystem that you looked uh, up to for advice or is this something that people don't talk about that you hope is talked about more often and maybe we can cover in this series in this future in the future? Um, yeah, we did we did look up to and, and had a lot of conversations with so many companies before starting this motion, like the open source motion and then in the midst of it. So folks from uh, Eldad from Upright, uh, Yuval from Application, uh, the folks from Gitpod, um, really quite a lot of, we had a lot of, you know, how how do you deal with, you know, simple things of, you know, how do you manage your roadmap? And like, you have GitHub issues, do you use Jira or not? And how do you connect them? Like things, you know, most of the companies don't have to deal with, for example, deployment, how do you manage, you know, the secrets and the deployment and how do you differentiate Docker, you know, builds and like so many problems that's like, they're very 
straightforward to solve, you know, if you're just closed source company, how do you do this now with, you know, being open and, and, you know, available like this. So it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot of folks helped us uh, along the way and still kind of, we are always kind of chatting with fellow founders are like, Hey, how do you do this? And how do you do this? And like, well, what's your thought about this? Uh, but it's a very collaborative community, I could say. Awesome. And thanks for the shout outs. Is there actually a place where best practices for open source organizations, open source founders are gathered? Uh, no, we, we've been uh, speaking with Omar, like, you know, we're trying to solve the same problems each all the time. And like, even having like, you know, a cost founders conference or something, yeah. this would be amazing, but I'm, I'm not familiar with any of those. So maybe, yeah. maybe. <laughs> that's, that's, that's cool. So, you know, I, I don't want to kind of like go too much overboard here, but any, any last thoughts you might like to, uh, share with people and maybe a message to uh, Novu uh, contributors, Novu community, um, and to people that are not familiar uh, with what it is, why they should uh, pay attention. Yeah, so uh, to be honest, nothing specific uh, from my end at this point. Just wanted to say thank you for this amazing uh, conversation. I really enjoyed it, and and also really love what you guys are doing in terms of, you know, the world is changing, and I think specifically right now with you know how we build software and like being able to jump in and it comes with uh, Gitpod and and code spaces of being able to spin up a project, you know, of you know and just contribute to it, so you don't have to set it up hours on your computer and etc. And with combination with different kind of types and flexibility also with working and and like how do you. Uh, operate as a freelancer or as an you know a solo developer in the world and it's like all connects right now to be able to you know contribute to so many areas and work on like on multiple projects and you quickly jump in and it's all streamlined and I think what you guys are doing on that part of you know also the the, the payment and kind of the compensation part is is really crucial part of the new world you know as as, as we go for it so I, I really appreciate what you're doing and also wish you all the all the best. Wow, thanks thanks so much <laughs> I, I really appreciate that and together we are seeing how things how things are evolving uh here yes, yes. <laughs> hope hope we get to to support uh thank you so much really really appreciate this and uh you know looking forward to maybe having a follow-up uh conversation uh, with, with pleasure <laughs> awesome all right